I'm not. I'm not going to be running much of the show tonight because we have uh, our faculty member, uh, Reverend Ed Henley, who has a connection with our speaker tonight, who's going to be uh, introducing him and uh, managing some of the conversation and, and question and answer tonight. Um, but before we turn it over uh, to Ed Henley, I'm going to ask uh, our staff person, Morgan Smith, if she has any uh, tech stuff she wants to go over with you all before we get started. Yes, so if everyone could remember for the discussion proportion of this evening, we will be using the raise hand functioning to be entered into the queue. When it's your turn, the moderator, Ed Henley, will call on you. After you've participated in the discussion, please mute yourself and lower your virtual hand. Thank you. All right, Ed. I didn't, I didn't know if you wanted me to say anything about you, but you can can, oh, can rep you can represent yourself. So okay, thank you so much. Uh, well, I'm Ed Henley. I'm on the faculty of the Bowen Center, and uh, as uh, she uh, mentioned, I'm somebody involved in ministry, so in the Episcopal Church, and uh, as such, that's how I first met uh, Dr. Frazier, which goes back. I figured it up. It's like 25 years, at least, maybe a little longer. And so we've known each other a long time. And as as happens in these ways, you know, you sort of go go apart and come back together and part together. And um, in the past uh, year or so, you know, got reacquainted, especially around uh, his uh, um, uh, more current scholarship. And it was just had Bowen theory jumping out at me throughout it. And um, uh, uh, he himself is is uh, uh, someone who uh, works in, in as a literary critic and, um, uh, and uh, not easy to pin you down academically because you've got African studies, you've got history, you've got drama, you've got... Um, uh, literary criticism. Uh, the, there was a write-up on you in this uh, in the preparation for this uh, talk, but um, most recently now he's on the faculty of uh, Penn State University, so he's coming to us from State College, Pennsylvania. But he's taught on the faculty of Temple, Princeton, and Howard Universities, and author of Pauline Hopkins uh, and Advocacy Journalism, and then. Um, uh, co-edited along with Natalie King Pedroso, this uh, book, Critical Responses About the Black Family in Toni Morrison's God Help the Child. And so in the critical responses, he, of course, did his editing work, but also has two articles in there, one entitled Navigating Lies to Experience What Some Call Romantic Love. And uh, that would poke a... Um, uh, you know, a Bowen theory thought of dating out of pseudo self, I call it. Um, and then another uh, chapter in here called socialized to silence. And so it's beginning to to hear already uh, the interaction of societal emotional process uh, with uh, family emotional process in the characters of Toni Morrison's writing. A little bit about Toni Morrison herself, um, uh, described in, in your book, Roan, as a culture bearer, teacher, public intellectual artist, advocate, prophet, and good mother. And um, she died not too long ago in 2019. She had won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993. She'd been on the faculty of Howard University uh, 1957 to 64, a number of other appointments, and then finally in her career, uh, Princeton University, 1989 until her retirement in 2006. And her um, first novel, The Bluest Eye, came out in 1970, and then God Helped the Child, which we're considering tonight in your responses. Um, came out in um, 2015, and that's her 11th and last novel. 
but many of her novels, really most of them, dealt in some way with the Black American experience. And I say those two words, um, you know, with, with a pause in between them, because the American experience and the Black cultural experience, experiencing fundamental cutoff in most cases from African uh, roots, family, um, the, the just the cutoff that happened in the forced migration to uh, these United States, and that um, the, the ramifications of that and uh, the nuances of that, I think, are coming out in the, um, the novel and in the, the responses. So um, uh, your co-author, Natalie King Pedroso, has some things to say about you, uh, Dr. Frazier. <laughs> and she uh, talked about when she first met you um, at the ALA, uh, American Literature Association panel, panel, which was dedicated to Morrison's most recent novel, which was this one in San Francisco. It says at that time, we were both teaching in two of the nation's largest historically back black colleges and universities, Howard University, and she was teaching in Florida A&M. The experiences on our campuses also colored our perspectives on that panel in San Francisco. It says, even with other engaging presentations during his talk, that is your talk, uh, Roan, on Morrison's novel, I heard the voice of a kindred spirit and we gravitated to each other at the conclusion of the session we came to some conclusions about the novel that we had not heard elsewhere. And so I uh, just uh, wanted to take note of that as, um, as we begin. But I want to invite our hearers tonight to put on your Bowen theory ears, not in order to reduce what is being said, not in a reductionist way, but to listen for specific expressions of societal emotional process, which is what I was hearing, um, and to listen for the interaction with family emotional process and the characters uh, that um, uh, Toni Morrison creates in her novel. And we read novels because they tell the truth about people. And so um, with that, I invite you, Dr. Frazier, to take off and uh, we can go for as long as you wish. Then I'd want to engage in some direct dialogue with you and then we will open up for more general discussion. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say Father Ed, you know, because that's how I first was introduced to you by my mom, you know, in St. Mark's Episcopal about, like you said, 25 years ago and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about my work with you. And thank you very much. Well, um, thank, thank you for you. our continuing our continuing relationship in many, many ways. Yes, so thank Absolutely. you. Um, very intellectually, spiritually edifying, you know, and that's rare in my life. So thank you for the example. Um, and to what to your comments earlier, um, thank you. I, that was the first time I ever heard that about my co-editor, Natalie, who is an associate professor of English at Florida a and &M. So I thank you because as you read, yes, a very much a kindred spirit um, that got a lot out of this novel. And the more we talked to each other and reflected on what Morrison intended, you know, as you said, the novel tells you about, Father Ed, you said about how people behave, you know, and this definitely novel it's like a mirror in many ways. It, it, it forces the reader to really think about how um, they can create the web. Yeah, the web that the character Bride has created and the character Booker has created. Um, so I'd just like to read two different paragraphs from my book that briefly touch on those webs that each of them created. Um, first of all, the novel, before I read my excerpt, is a series of character to reader conversations. It begins with the mother of the family um, who, whose name is Sweetness. And she talks very honestly 
Um, we don't know exactly who she's talking to, but she's talking about her early concerns in bearing her child, particularly the one she names Lula Ann. And she begins talking about how surprised she sweetness was at the color of how dark skinned um, her daughter Lula Ann was. And so she questions that. And so she poses reasons for her being dark because she doesn't like it. It's a stigma for her. So the more stories you read of Morrison's novel, the more the larger single story unfolds about what events happened. How did Sweetness raise her daughter Lula Ann, who later renames herself Bride? How did Bride become in a relationship with the man she comes to know as Booker? How did Booker um, get to his place where he meets um, the man who, um, well, where Booker meets the woman who he admits to wanting to be with at the end of the novel? How did he come to that situation? Um, they both come to meeting each other, but the beauty, Father Ed and my audience, the beauty of this novel is something my father said when he bought um, one of Morrison's novels when I was much younger. The beauty of this novel is discovering the jigsaw puzzle that it is. And then when you see that jigsaw puzzle in the novel and you're putting it together as a reader, the act of putting your own jigsaw puzzle together. So both the behaviors of Bride and her suitor, Booker, get the reader to question in what ways are you repeating this behavior? Or in what ways are you the reader repeating these unhealthy behaviors? And in what way can you rectify? Um, so I just wanna um, begin with that proviso and then um, just read two paragraphs of my article. Um, in this book, it's an amazing book that I highly recommend. As Father Ed mentioned, it's called Critical Responses About the Black Family in Toni Morrison's God Help the Child. This artwork was featured in the film um, about Toni Morrison um, called The Pieces I Am, but the, the name of the artist is Jacob Lawrence. And um, we had to get permission and I'm grateful we did. It, it just enhances the whole piece of the, of, of, of the book cover. So this first and second paragraph comes from an article called Socialized to Silence. In her 11th novel, God Help the Child, Toni Morrison deals more directly than any other, than any of her other novels with the dynamic of the black male, black female relationship in the 21st century. She poses the question of how black men and black women can love each other despite experiencing what black psychologist Kobe Kambon has called the Ma'afa, which is the Holocaust of African peoples. That included the European enslavement of African descended people, chattel slavery within the United States, and at least one century of Jim Crow discrimination. Morrison's characters, Booker Starburn and Lula Ann Bridewell are characters in their twenties. And by the end of the novel, they both pursue committed love. Lula Ann, who changed her name to Bride because she thought the name Lula Ann was dumb and countrified, wants to love Booker. However, Bride, uh, the older Lula Ann, is shocked by his sudden departure from her life. She tells the reader she does not want to think about him, nor how empty, how trivial, how lifeless everything seems without him. She visits a park, looks at teenage dog walkers, and in Booker's absence, thinks about a long life of intimacy. And now I'm gonna to skip to Booker's experience. Yes. Uh, it's at the end and it's really summing up, you know, here we go. Booker exhibits more competencies of uh, African self-consciousness than bride. Nevertheless, his prideful logic disallows him from interrogating the necessary questions that will allow him to pursue his deep-seated interest in a committed relationship. 
his and Bride's experience is an important lesson in the, yeah, in the necessity and the importance. It's, a, it's an important example um, about asking the necessary questions and telling the necessary truths that will allow both to express love in a positive way. For the character Bride, she, um, she avoids telling necessary truths. And when you read her backstory through the first person um, direct addresses from the different characters, um, you discover that because she chose not to tell an important truth in the early part of the relationship, the relationship suffered. Um, she tells the reader, she tells her friend, but she does not tell um, the person she is interested in. Um, and you can infer as the reader why, because many people upon meeting somebody they think they might love or they think they may want to spend the rest of their life with um, have various reasons for not telling what they think are ugly or painful truths. So the character Bride um, is, a, is one that, um, does not ask the necessary questions that will allow her to express love in a positive way. The other character, Booker, we get the backstory. So the novel has four parts. Parts one and part two are Bride's story. Parts three and four, I don't want to ruin it completely. I'm coming close. I'm dancing around without telling you because I encourage our readers here to read the novel. Uh, but understand in terms of Bowen theory, for me, what made this novel speak to multiple disciplines, sociology, psychology, social work, um, is, is the fact that there's a courtroom trial and people from the traditional disciplines that we regard as experts um, basically participate in bride's own secrets, I'll put it like that. Adult bride, young Lula Ann, okay? So there's a complicity of those in, in the traditional disciplines with the um, hiding, the hiding that the older character um, engages in. And that hiding um, that old bride engages in through her memories we learn in the novel, um, you see the role that plays in causing um, in the novel a big disruption, causing the separation, causing Booker, um, her suitor, to, to leave suddenly. Um, so that's what we get in the first two parts, the backstory of Bride. We get her mother. The novel opens with her mother. It's telling the reader how ashamed she was of uh, Lula Ann or Bride's color. We also get in those first two parts the story of her best friend, Brooklyn, who works with her and who more or less helps her to stay relevant in the industry she works in, which is for Bride Cosmetics. Um, we get Brooklyn, we get Bride um, most of the time in those first two parts, and we get her mother. In part three and four, we don't get Bride's perspective mainly, primarily we get Booker. We know how he was raised, we know what school he went to, um, and we also learn what we call very comfortably in today's 21st century world, his triggers. And his triggers have to do with losing his brother to unfortunately a pedophile. That is the theme of uh, Morrison's novel, the um, very real and unfortunate abuse that happens to children and how people turn a blind eye to it. So the man that Bride has become interested in without telling her um, directly, also has this history of um, molestation. Because what I did not mention is that um, one of the big memories Bride has in the first two books is a memory of a little boy she knows being molested. And her mother, without giving too much away, um, gives her instructions about what she should do um, <laughs> with that information. Um, and because she does that, the whole novel, when you put it together, put the pieces together of the novel like a jigsaw puzzle, you're able to relate um, her being silent about witnessing that abuse of a child to 
silencing herself in a relationship. And then you see the consequences. Um, the novel, she's, Morrison's very clear about the consequences that come about as a result of lies and silence. I think one of the main epigraphs that I chose very intentionally um, for my particular introduction to this book was Booker's line to his aunt, his aunt queen telling his aunt, um, the aunt asks Booker, why are you arguing um, with Bride? And he tells her, lies, silence, lies, period, silence, not knowing the truth or why. Okay, and he's aware already of this um, by the time he says that to his aunt, because by that time in part four of the novel, Bride has pursued him. The whole novel is Bride seeking answers to why he suddenly leaves. That's the story. It's a compelling story Morrison has written. In Booker's side of the novel, we get that he is a boy turned man who grew up in a very engaged, loving, committed, family who would sit down to Saturday morning meals and talk about issues, talk about current events. Um, he, he was trained to critically think with that routine of not watching television. And by that example alone, Morrison um, has suggested, not endorsed wholeheartedly, but suggested a model for family relationships in the 21st century when we're all overwhelmed, each family in this day and age with smartphones, with tablets, with laptops. Um, and we're encouraged to use that. I just um, was talking to a friend personally yesterday and she shared, I mean, in her own grandchildren's family, how when her grandchildren stay with her, their grandma, when she says, okay, come down to dinner, it's a routine of, she says, getting them to not bring their tablet. She said, don't bring your tablet to the table uh, because our 21st century life, you know, for many of us requires the presence of some device. Well, what Morrison is suggesting just by how she wrote the background of her character, Booker, family time, dinner time is a requirement. You know, you talk about what you feel, what you love, you disagree, but you disagree as Barbara Walters who passed away um, earlier this month. Um, you disagree respectfully without disrespecting or insulting your family member. And those patterns um, have to be, um, especially among children started from early. So in the second half of the book, we get Booker's background, but he, like Bride, um, has the history of, um, of a close person, a peer or a close person in his life being molested and him witnessing the silencing of the person he looked up to to the most, the male figure he looked up to the most, the father. So in Booker's story, without giving too much away, he sees how his father silences himself because of his older son's death, who is Booker's brother's death. And Ron, you, can give us a, you can give a little more away. That story in the book. Yes. <laughs> Not too much, right. Oh, no, so, give me, give me, uh, has, little, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> I, I was just going to finish by saying, yeah, he, okay. hides, yeah, he hides um, information that if they were able to share, could have avoided the pain and could have avoided the sudden um, departure, could have allowed a deeper path to understanding. And so uh, the lesson and the lesson is, is, you know, the value of truly in a relationship um, with a family member listening. And if anything else I wanted to do um, by editing this book with Natalie King Pedroso. Um, I wanted to encourage serious listening among readers, you know, to sit down and listen. Father Ed has heard me talk about the value of study groups. So it doesn't have to be like a formal book. It could just be a novel um, or just a project that two people are working on together. I'm a playwright, so I know what it takes to work with actors to rehearse lines 
um, that whole process is a process where you have to practice and be the character and listen. Um, but overall, um, the, the, what, what Morrison is doing with Booker and Bride is showing the value of listening to each other so that you'll be able to express love in a positive way. So I don't know if you have any feedback, Father Ed. Well, 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 the um, the backstories of these um, uh, of, of these characters is so strong in terms of how the, uh, the emotional process of the society around them was working, and and what it set up. You know, not in a cause and effect way, but it just participated in it. I mean, I, I kind of want to read the the opening paragraph of the book of sweetness here. Okay, that's, that's okay. Sure. And this, this is the opening page of of the book. She says, "It's not my fault, so you can't blame me. I didn't do it, and I have no idea how it happened. It didn't take more than an hour after they pulled her out from between my legs to realize something was wrong, really wrong. She was so black, she scared me." Midnight black, Sudanese black. I'm light skinned with good hair, what we call high yellow, and so is Lula Ann's father. Ain't nobody in my family anywhere near that color. Tar is the closest thing I can think of, yet her hair don't go with her skin. It's different, but straight and curly like those naked tribes in Australia. And anyhow, she goes goes on. And then the horror of her husband, who was um working on the railroad so i mean he comes back and um he so the, immediately this this societal process of prizing the lighter color yes was was just permeating everybody you know th so this is that piece of societal process and her husband then he's a porter on the rail when he got off a, a off the rails, he looked at me like I was crazy and looked at her like she was from the planet Jupiter. He wasn't a cussing man, so when he said, God damn, what the hell is this? I knew we were in trouble. <laughs> that's what did it. That's what caused, and now she's blaming it. She says, that's what caused the fights between him, me and him. It broke our marriage to pieces. We had three good years together, but when she was born, he blamed me and treated Lula Ann like she was a stranger more than that an enemy he never touched her i never did convince him that i ain't ever ever fooled around with another man but he was dead sure i was lying and so you know here's a, a societal process permeating american society about shade oh, and color yes. and then it intersecting with their their that process intersecting with their marital process and this is laying the foundation for lula ann doing anything she can to get her mother to touch Absolutely. her anything yes. to get her mother to touch her even telling you know spoiler alert even telling a vicious lie in court that gets somebody convicted because it produced her mother's approval and then, I mean, this is part of this this jigsaw puzzle that you're talking about unfolding. So I just wanted to throw in just some of the graphic character of of how she's describing that those larger societal processes coming right in to the family emotional processes at work, which then render both Booker and Bride incapable of honestly presenting themselves to each other as people and when you get close to honestly presenting then running away when you um read that section father ed i thought about a friend of mine who um sent me a video of a calypsonian trinidadian calypsonian singing caribbean man and the message says you know do by your family spend time with them basically and i remembered why 
I suddenly remembered why this person, this friend sent me this because he was dealing with his own neglect and told me very directly. And then he demonstrated it without telling me. And then I had to connect the dots and say, oh yeah, he did tell me that the reason he neglects is because he's, he's felt neglect from his father. So I say all that to say, you know, children um, do a lot, as you mentioned about bride, for the love or the affection of their parent. And uh, we live in a world where a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of books about Bill Clinton's coming to mind immediately and Bill Clinton's father, um, you know, just about what people will do, um, the great lengths they'll go to have that love for their parent. And so, like you said, bride does something. Um, yeah, you can say it's bad, but you can't say you don't know why if she does something bad. If you really read the novel, you feel, you know, because um, you feel for her because her mother thinks of her in a certain way because of her skin color. And um, to compensate, you know, she does something unethical, definitely. Yeah. And then she gets the approval of her mother who then holds her hand and walks proudly down the street with her because she had gotten somebody wrongfully convicted. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the consequences. And the consequences oh. then that go on from there. Yeah. A, a, a sidebar is uh, um, what Toni Morrison said about Bill Clinton. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've ever come across this. Yeah, word. I remember. Yeah, she says, White skin notwithstanding, Tony Morrison talking about Bill Clinton. White skin notwithstanding, this is our first black president, blacker than any actual black person who could ever be elected in our children's lifetime. After all, Clinton displays almost every trope of blackness single parent household, born poor, working class, saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I remember, yeah, I mean, Bill Clinton, yeah, um, Toni Morrison, I remember when she said that, and that, yeah, there's so much to say. I have a lot of thoughts going all at once. Oh, well, yeah. um, what a lot of people, a lot of people, um, Yeah, they're, they're jumbled now, but I'm going to get them organized. And, okay, well, that was a little, um, little off topic, but yeah, but uh, to throw that one in. But um, the, uh, the, the Bowen theorists could take this novel and draw out a family diagram and mm -hmm. see the trajectory of things the emotional trajectories, you know, coming down uh, through the generations. But part of it would be to include the societal processes that, that are at work in this family as well. And very often in Bowen theory, uh, the, the societal emotional process was probably one of the least developed of Murray Bowen's concepts. And a lot of the talk is, like, are we generally as a society more or less differentiated, but it, it seems to have specific manifestations and not all people sit in the society in the same place by any means. Some people are folk a focus and in this uh, novel we see also where um, uh, social workers and school counselors were a focus of societal anxiety, which wound up putting pressure on the young Lula Ann yeah, absolutely. Um, to, now uh, I remember. Now I remember what I wanted to say. When you read that yeah. quote from Bill Clinton, the greater context of that quote is she was saying that he was the first black president because of how he was treated regarding yeah. what Ken Starr was doing with the Monica Lewinsky scandal. That's and right. so, yeah. in many of Morrison's nonfiction works, like she edited a work about Clarence Thomas being nominated, and she edited a nonfiction work about the O.J. Simpson trial. And in both of those works, she's highly critical of the mainstream media. So when they, when, when she saw the attacks against Clinton's character because of his 
um, you know, of what Ken Starr chose to investigate, she saw him being treated as if he was black, but that's very much in line with what she's, the same thing she's doing in this novel, which is encouraging, goading the reader to ask questions. When she was interviewed by Susan Swain on C-SPAN, that's what she kept saying over and over. I'm not, I don't write books to tell people answers. I write books to get people to ask the question. And when you start asking the question of what is the direct relationship between Lula Ann and the teacher she's accusing, when you yeah. investigate that real relationship, then you understand what Father Ed said, how deep um, she lied, you know, how deep Lula Ann lied. And that's Morrison's whole point. Don't just believe with the media. Now we have the internet at our fingertips. Investigate, question it for yourself. Yeah, the teacher she was accusing had already been convicted in the press. Mm. And the, um, uh, and the uh, uh, helping professions had counseled all the children how to testify against the teachers. And it appears from the context of the novel, the only thing the teacher did was have some unconventional teaching methods, which were totally innocent. But somehow she had been singled out as being somebody that needs to be gotten rid of. So uh, it was kind of- What's interesting, Father Ed, Yeah, you, you get that. However, what's interesting is to ask another reader who clearly sides with the mainstream media in that novel. Okay. and see Sophia as a criminal. And I'm like, I don't even argue with them. There was to, to one person and then certain people who, there's the, this is not the only collection. Ours is the first, but there's a second one that just came out by Florida State University professor, Maxine Montgomery. And um, I forget the original editor who was at a school in Northeastern. Um, and they edited a collection. And in a lot of those, they um they don't question the conviction of Sophia Huxley, and oh, in my mind, I'm like, why 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 wouldn't why would you why wouldn't you question it, you know? But yeah. they you know they see her as a criminal. So what Morrison is really doing is seeing if the reader is bold enough to you know question, or are they going to just believe it because, as 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 Sweetness says, it's in the newspapers and in the television. Yeah. And Sweetness, Lula Ann's mom, also silenced Lula Ann for seeing a young boy molested by the landlord because you don't make waves, Lula Ann, because if you do, he's the landlord, we're going to be thrown out on the street. So don't see, don't say, in, don't say the truth about that molestation, but make me proud by testifying in court, just like you were coached by your counselors to do, yes, to wrongly convict somebody. So you had the double lie, which left Lulan in a very bad position. I mean, once you see the whole trajectory of this, to enter into a, a an authentic kind of relationship with with Booker, definitely. And how um, to bring all that honesty that's necessary for them to be in, in committed relationship one to another that isn't just them presenting their false selves to each other. Presenting their false selves. Yeah, so and here then, we are from Bowen theory perspective where we're hearing pseudo self, you know, <laughs> we're hitting you know, multi-generational emotional process we're hitting societal emotional process. We're hitting all of these things. And how Toni Morrison manages to awaken all that much Bowen theory in my head in something which I read in one sitting because I couldn't put it down. <laughs> so my first reading, I read this whole book one straight through. I just did. So. Yeah. And that's a word out there. It's not that long. A couple hundred pages, you can do it. You know, you can do it, you know, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Just go, forget what we all said, you know, when you read it and do yeah. your best to do it in one read, just believe the care, believe everything they tell you. 
especially at the end. Um, and go with, just believe what they say in the moment and then um, just see how it unfolds. And, and, and you'll see the puzzle pieces together by the end. Yeah. And I think what's striking also is that some of the characters show greater awareness um, as the book progresses, but some of the characters sort of only get sort of part way there. You know, they're still saying the old stuff. Yes, even on her yeah, deathbed. So, yeah, so it leaves you in that very, that very mixed thing. And so here it sounds at the end as Booker and Bride are now they're they're getting ready to have a baby. They're and it looks like absolutely blue sky because they've gotten to this new awareness. Yet at the same time, there's all the hints that, you know, all these things which students of bone theory understand. We've got we've got a real repetitive nature to uh, to human beings, and so it ends by saying, "God help the child." Yeah, uh, God help. Those were words the from sweetness. Um, really lamenting, in a sense, the fact that at the end of the novel, her daughter sends her uh, money, but uh, no return address, you know, as if to say, I just want to make sure you're okay, but don't try and reach out, you know, and then no. she keeps good. Um, and as a reader, you have to sympathize with, because for me, sweetness represents the old generation, my parents, my grandparents, and their outdated, obsolete beliefs but still the value of those beliefs in helping me get up in the morning, in motivating me to go to work. in so even though it's problematic, it's abusive, definitely by modern standards, it's still functional, you know? Um, so you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. The benefit of how there are gifts to how sweetness raised bride, these fictional characters that we can pick apart and compare to ourselves and our peers. Um, but th 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 there are disadvantages to how Sweetness raised Bride. You know, she raised her to tell a lie, as many parents do. But there are also advantages. She taught her and prepared her to be a executive, you know, gave her the routine, gave her the stable housing, even though she had to pretend like she didn't see abuse happening to maintain it. Um, yeah, parents. Yeah. Make those yeah, she's trying to come to terms with how she um, how she raised her and trying to just do a bit of a review saying, well, I know I was hard on her, but it was all for her own good and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, and trying to come to terms with herself in her own final um, final section. I thought I had a piece of it here, but I don't think I do. But um, but uh, as they do, you mean as they work their way through, though they get to a a real um, uh, yeah, a real point of just laying out things with with all of its complexity all of its nuance and all of its unanswered questions she definitely does that yeah shall we see what sort of questions are in the room any uh dialogue we can have with our audience here you want to try that I'd like to ask a question about. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, just one second, um, okay. uh, Elizabeth. Uh, if we can do the raised hand, fun uh, if you can raise your hand, it's under in the reactions bar, um, just so we know the um, the order with which folks yes uh, have asked their question. That would be um, that would be wonderful, and we can kind of proceed from. Yeah, there. I'm sorry, I can't find the raised hand. Okay, but in as much as there are no other hands up yet, we will let you speak. Go ahead. Please introduce yourself. I don't see you. Yes, yet. I'm Elizabeth Eddy. I'm uh, I'm in Pittsburgh. Uh, Bowen Theory State College, not too far. 
uh, four or five hours. <laughs> but the question I have, Dr. Fraser, is the I found inner. I have a question about the part of the story towards the end where Bride has her accident and she spends all of that time with a family who in our society is another whole type of family than than any of than very many people have experienced, um, certainly not anyone living in the city. And um, I'm wondering if uh, somebody could maybe give some insight into, because there was a lot of, there was a lot of that story there. And what was Toni Morrison's purpose of putting that in the story of, of Bride's experiences? I think for me, the, that taught her, is your name Betty? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you. Elizabeth, yeah. thanks for that question. Elizabeth, what that part taught me, I mean, I think the reason Morrison put that part in there is because that prepared her to, um, once she left Evelyn and Steve, which is what, um, who the narrator calls a hippie couple, like you said, she crashes her car and she breaks her ankle. And uh, she finds this little girl, Rain, who she follows to a couple who's taking care of Rain, named Evelyn and Steve. And she stays with them, convalesces until her ankle heals. And they are one step she needs to go through psychologically and spiritually before she is prepared to really be with Booker because Evelyn and Steve teach her how to do things without expecting anything. Evelyn and Steve, the white hippie couple from Northern California, teach her how to live without hot water. Teach her how to live without indoor plumbing. You know, when she cries, <laughs> I feel her pain because I remember when I first moved to Jamaica, my parents are Jamaican, and Evelyn and Steve live closer to the way I think my parents more of my parents' parents live in rural Jamaica. No hot water, okay? No indoor plumbing. But the way of life is just totally different. You're closer to nature um, and you depend more on each other in a more harmonious way of life. And when she observes that, when she observes the household chores being done cooperatively by Evelyn and Steve, it is that experience that enables her to put into practice from this hippie couple, um, to put into practice what she learned from Evelyn and Steve when she finally finds Booker and his aunt has a horrific accident. And I mean, it's a calamity for um, his aunt and her family, but it turns out to be a benefit because while his aunt is convalescing, she treat, she bride with Booker helps the aunt heal, even though she, does, she doesn't end up completely healing um, in a way that Evelyn and Steve treated her when she, Bride, was injured. So I hope that answers your question. May I make one more comment, Kathleen? Yes, go ahead. Um, I, I can also see in that part of the story how Toni Morrison then introduced another family emotional system with Rose and the life that she had led, that she had led and all of her children and how that family functioned and didn't function. And yet um, Rose and Booker were able to stay close because Booker stayed in touch with Rose. So similar to um, Bride, not only sending money to her mother, and that was the way that relationship functioned, some of Rose's children, her, especially her daughter, that she talks about when she's dying, did a, did a similar thing, would, would send her money. But Booker kept in touch. Yeah, and it's telling that, um, thank you, Elizabeth, it's telling that while Aunt Queen, um, Booker's aunt, um, had suffered that injury, her children, her many children did not come to see her. You know, 
Uh, but like you said, Booker was there, her nephew, but not her children, which speaks to, you know, her own, you know, um, relationship um, similar to Sweetness and Bride. Now the Bowen theory eyes will see cut off all over the place in, in this novel in various manifestations of it. And uh, in the cutoff serving different functions at different times and uh, it being adaptive and damaging altogether. Okay, we have Scott Hopkins. Scott. Good to see you, Ed, and thank you, Ron, for being with us tonight. So glad to see this invitation this morning in my email. And uh, I've read several books by Toni Morrison. And I was just wondering, in the other books that I've read as well, wouldn't we see as many Bowen Theory um, hooks and anchors in any of her novels, or is there more in this one, do you think? I don't know. I think, um, well, in terms of my awareness of Morrison's work, um, she's always dealing with the outcast. There's an outcast in every one of her novels, a social outcast. In this case, novel's case, it's Sophia Huxley and the first novel is Pecola. So what I know about Bowen theory is I don't see it as um, one that encourages where parents and children encourage to keep the outcast the outcast the, what makes the novel story is one of one of people one of one person in a community questioning um the the the, the classification of the outcast um and 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 bride kind of begins to do that but doesn't do it completely which is why something bad happens to her uh, but yeah, I think where I see a common theme in all of Morrison's works is the out, why is the outcast the outcast question mark? And it's up to the reader to pick that apart. I don't know what Bowen, Bowen theory says about um, um, in any cultural group, um, the outcast. Well, you know, part of it would say that togetherness impulse would agree that, yeah, that outcast is the outcast, and then somebody needs to stand apart, exhibit a level of differentiation of self to say, I don't think I see that, you know, and, and risk the disapproval that comes from not seeing what everybody's seeing. And yet, you know, so that becomes, a, you know, fundamental dramatic element in, in, in any in any of her works, I would think. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. All right. Do we have other questions coming up? Ah, uh, Randall Frost. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fraser, for being with us tonight. I was, was thinking um, when you described the secrets that uh, Booker and, uh, and Bride had that they didn't share with one another and how that seemingly strained their relationship to the breaking point. Um, and then at some point they were able to be more forthcoming about their past. This is very similar to what Murray Bowen talks about with the idea of a person-to-person -person relationship. That is where one person in principle can say anything about themselves or the relationship to the other without um, having to worry about the other's reaction. <laughs> and when you can do that, you've got a wide open relationship and when that can exist in a marriage and in other relationships, you have a very resilient uh, relationship. So that's what got one of the things that got stirred for me in listening to your description. Yes, absolutely. The, the ability to tell 
your truth without being misunderstood um, or um, stigmatized. Yeah, um, it requires really trust, which has to be built and mm -hmm. earned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that trust has to be earned. Um, I have to say, you know, the reason I named my introduction um, Navigating What Some Call Romantic Love, Morrison had a very uh, skeptical or pessimistic view about romantic love. Mm -hmm. But as the critic, you know, who sees differently, just reading her interviews, I see how skeptical she is of love. You can't avoid it. I feel like it's the elephant in the room. So like you said, uh, you, what is your name, sir? Randy Frost. Randy. Like you said, Randy, it, one has to really trust the other person to be able to mm -hmm. um, tell it without fear um, of, of ridicule. And as somebody who's navigated relationships, I know how hard that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, Morrison has really provided a, a realistic example, specifically in Booker Who Runs. I know too many people in my life, friendship or relationship, when the heat gets up, they run. And um, I've always seemed to be the type of person in my personal experiences to watch people run. Um, and the lesson for me in watching them run is not to chase them. Mm -hmm. And I think the appeal of reading and explaining this novel is Bride's pursuit of Booker. Um, but in terms of avoiding um, the practice of avoiding unhealthy, toxic relationships, I personally found it more healthy to not run. And then Morrison leaves open, not chase rather, not chase people. And then Morrison leaves open the question of do you know whether it really will be harmonious? All he does is say, when she tells him she's pregnant and, and she says, I wanna take care of my child. And he says something like, no, it's our child. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what happens after that, right? We must assume they're gonna begin a family. That's why um, the title of this book is Family. Mm -hmm. One would like to believe that because of the child, one learns how to be completely honest, but you know, reality tells us that doesn't always happen. But I know that based on my experience, just looking at my parents, just looking at Father Ed and Sherry, relationships enhance one, mm -hmm. allow men live, to live longer, men in particular, various studies show that. So you have to, I think each person has to work on their shadows. And this is a novel about shadow work. Bride has her shadow that she began to expose because she's problematic, right? Like most people uh, uh, expresses her shadow by fighting and, and, and literally assaults Booker, you know, while she's dealing with her shadow. Hmm. Booker um, didn't really show his shadow. I mean, even though he, he listened to her and he, explain to his aunt what was going on. Um, he still, I think, at the end of this novel has work to do in eliminating his shadow. And by shadow, I mean the limiting beliefs that if I tell this person this, they're going to run mm -hmm. or it's going to be a calamity, a tragedy if I express mm -hmm. my true feelings. And so um, I think for me, this novel just highlights still that importance of doing one's shadow work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Person to person relationship. Person to person. Yeah. Um, that's really honest and vibrating and believing that um for me, yeah, believing that you will find somebody who can handle that truth. Right. I think that's a big thing. And thinking about your parents or anybody you know who is a relationship you'd like. You know, mm -hmm. all of us have a relationship that we would like to have, somebody we know, or we may already be in it, of a relationship we like. 
Right. Young, young one. Yeah, that was a piece of advice my mother uh, gave me when I was, uh, you know, a young man. It's, uh, it's more important to like somebody than to love them. And I wonder <laughs> if that uh, fits with uh, Toni Morrison's yes. skepticism about romantic love. Yes, deep, yeah, she does. Yeah. Um, she called it the most de uh, destructive thing in human history. Yeah, because she was really talking about the mainstream filtering of romantic love, you know, Lifetime movie channel version of love. It's a little more than that. Mm -hmm. Love is more, it's a more, um, that line from Beloved, where Sixo is talking about the 30 mile woman is closer to what I think Morrison means by love. He said of her, she was a friend of my mind. Like you said, you have to like their mind. You have to like them mm -hmm. in order to, you know, love to begin, I think, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, thank you. Sure, okay. you're, welcome. you're welcome. All right, Anne McKnight is next, and Anne. Good evening, thank you for coming and discussing this novel with us. It's really- a you're so in Bowen theory, so <laughs> this may be more than you want to know. <laughs> there is um, this idea of the power of the multi-generational process. That is, we're all a part, it's like a river, you know, that flows down the generations that we're all a part of. Um, and, and it has an imprint in, it, it doesn't determine, but it has an imprint in our lives. And I, I wondered in this novel, did you see that as important in the lives of the characters? You know, I mean, it's, it's often we're kind of caught and, and unless we can figure out a way to navigate it, it has a determination. And did you think about that in terms of the characters that you um, are interpreting? <laughs> Yes, especially sweetness, who, as uh, Father Ed read of her mother or her grandmother, passed for white and ignored the family. So because that happened to sweetness, that's multi-generation. Uh, Lula Ann felt what she felt about her own mother because of what sweetness um, obviously felt through her grandmother, who passed and ignored um, the darker side of the family. So this need for um, affection, for attention, um, for acknowledgement as a family member is what uh, Lula and was dealing with coping with. Like a lot of us do unethical things. Like I was telling you about my friend from Trinidad who sent me the Calypsonian song, Caribbean Man. And then I had to remember, cause it was random. It was a random text that he still in his behavior and in what he says is looking for the love of the father that he never got. A real life friend of mine, similar to the fictional bride, uh, bride who went as a little girl, um, when she was a little girl, Lula Ann was looking for the love from her mother. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, so to be able to talk about that with a partner, person to person is powerful. Um, and then to relate how talk about how similar um, the other person's experiences that's that's everything that's everything well you know i, I think we often <laughs> hello from that to, we often come out of our families okay that's bad. no echo anymore what did you say Anne? Well, what I was going to say is we often come out of our families with a, a, a perceptual framework, like this is, this is reality. <laughs> we, we play it out, you know, and different people's families have different perceptual realities, you know, and then you get into trying to <laughs> interpret with one another. But I, I think it is really interesting in this particular family 
that it goes, that it sort of sorts out in skin color, because I think in many other families, it, there's all kinds of other aspects of how the reactivity gets, gets framed about one child or another child or another family member. Um, you know, they're, they're just different frameworks about how that operates. You're, you want to be in a different religion. No, your politics are different. No, you know, you're, you're not working in the right place. Um, but I, I just think, I mean, I, I love Toni Morrison's novels and I think it's, it's just really fascinating to see your description of this one. Thank you. Yeah. I don't think I read that line about grandma, but you get societal process, family process, cut off all of it in about two lines. She's talking about where did, how did the girl get so dark? She says, you should have seen my grandmother. She passed for white and never said another word to any one of her children. Any letter she got from my mother or my aunt, she sent right back unopened. Finally, they got the message of no message in letter B. Almost all mulatto types and quadroons did that back in the day, if they had the right kind of hair, that is. And you just go, whoa. I mean, so much is packed into just a couple of lines like that in terms of and in terms of Bowen theory concepts. I mean, they're just jumping out all over the place. So anyhow. All right. Let's see. We're a little bit after eight, and uh, we have until 8.30 if we want it. But at the same time, an hour is good. And uh, we'll see if there are any more uh, uh, questions coming from those who are present. But. Uh, I always look forward to my discussions of things with you, Likewise. Dr. Frazier. You want to call me Father Ed, I want to call you Roan, but you know, we'll, okay, yeah, so that's how we are. And uh, uh, so uh, if there are no more and questions. we have a we have a couple folks we have oh we did have a couple yeah. pop up okay i see it now priscilla friesen yes dr fraser i have a question another idea uh that's also a part of bowen theory that i don't think we think about as much is that the ability to be more of a self is a natural process just as much as the constraint is natural, <laughs> you know, meaning the constraint of being something more than you are, your constraints are. So I was wondering, and I have not read this novel, so I was wondering in these characters, is there a natural ability to adapt beyond what the constraints are in any of the characters that are a part of this novel? Yes, primarily with Bride. And she talks about being teased for her dark skin. Um, she was already neglected for her dark skin and she adapts. She, she talks about how good she is at being obedient. Um, she talks about um, the importance of doing that and where it's gotten her. She's clear on how her mother's helped her. Um, but in terms of the time in which, the, in, in real time, she still doesn't want to maintain a communicative relationship with her, but she's very aware of how her mother has helped her um, get to where she is, a self. And to your question, that is why she renames herself. Um, and then when you get to know her, you understand completely why, why artists name them, rename themselves often, but she renames herself Bride. Um, yeah because she sees herself as a bride, but she sees herself as adapting to your question um, to a world where, and it's a tragic world, but it's a world where a lot of people think it's true. To get affection, you must lie, you know? And that just breaks my heart when I think of young people 
I don't want any young people thinking you have to lie in order to get somebody's affection. That's so cruel, you know. I, I'm a hugger, you know. I'm a hugger and I'm a cat lover, so mm -hmm. I am very effusive <laughs> with my affection. But yeah, I just you you should not have to lie. And so there's an important sense memory part at the end of the novel where you could tell she has adapted because she associates Booker's hand holding with genuine expression rather than forced confession, you know, or forced uh, false creation. So I believe Bride is the character, Morrison's main character that does that. I do want to also mention, I'm working on a paper by the brilliant playwright, Leslie Lee, and I love it when male characters do this. He has this male character named Cairo, who by the end of the play kills the lie. And you know, you're so happy at the end. It's like, thank you for not falling for the lie. Um, Cairo, Cairo is the name of that character in Leslie Lee's play, Sundown Names and Not Gone Things. So that's in my head now, but Bride is one who mm -hmm. adapts over and does and becomes a- Beyond, new. yeah, beyond. I look forward to reading the book. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Andrea Shara. I was just thinking of what it would be like to have read a book, not know anything about Bowen theory, and then come to this group. <laughs> and I guess you do know something about it, right? So how how is it useful? I was thinking about, you know, empathy, great empathy for the characters. And does Bowen theory lend itself to a way out for people? That's what I was thinking. It's a natural process. And Priscilla was talking about that, a natural process to scapegoat the weak ones. And um, problem, that's probably never going to end. Um, but there may be ways, and maybe in this novel, there's a way to dig yourself out from under the kind of uh, projection that your family and society can put on you. So I don't know if Bowen theory helps to become more neutral and objective because you see it as this primitive part of, of nature, of life. Just throw that at you. <laughs> I think from what I know, and Father Ed can elaborate on this, Bowen theory gets us to uh, consider both at once, more than one family systems, the father, parent, child, and then the sibling to sibling. Um, for me, when I read Bowen theory, I was like, okay, this is dealing with understanding systems within families, um, within families. The dynamics, um, which come back to the self for me, still within that children have to have a self, an actualized self and not a sketch of, from somebody else. Um, and it, it's a challenge to all the traditional disciplines. That's how I see Bowen. It was really challenging sociology. It was really challenging psychology. Um, so uh, working with them and then the technology aspect, how do these theories still hold up since 1950 um, when we're now dealing with the smartphone and the tablet? How, how is that going to, you know, do we communicate through the tablet? And... <laughs> No, it has to be still that personal interaction. Yeah. That personal interaction has to maintain, has to be there always. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, Thank and you. I, I think, uh, yeah, you can just see the bitter end of it when, when there's not personal interaction and people do not care about each other, but they're, and Bowen used to say, climbing up on the backs of the schizophrenics. So that... You can use other people, as you know, to get ahead. Yeah. And there's too much of that. But if, you know, I don't know if Bowen theory can help people be more objective and neutral about the way the emotional system is 
configured, you know, when you look at the beginnings of these families that you're describing, you can see how it's, you know, all kind of set up. Very structured cookie cutter. Very structured cookie cutter, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do you do to stand up to those forces and, and, you know, be so that some of these things roll off your back? I don't know. That's what I was just thinking about. Peer, family like Booker yeah. had with his aunt, peers that will support yeah. you. They say, I see what you're doing. Don't stop. Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> this is where social media can help with certain inspirational, motivational speakers on social media. Um, certain people do that for me. Um, Com Cosmic Byron on IG and April Mason on IG. Um, because they, when they've shared their backgrounds, it's very similar to mine. Um, Two-parent household, still looking for love, never giving up on it. Um, and then navigating with others, talking to others about how they navigate their childhood traumas, avoiding bonds that are trauma bonds um, and focusing on bonds that help you meet your core needs and 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 with somebody who's helping you what accomplish your goal whatever your goal is they care about what you care about um, they want to help you accomplish your goal i think those basic things are what make any relationship work friendship or more thank you Okay, sure. we've got a couple more. Ann Curran. Um, thank you for bringing this book to my attention. Um, I'm reading Michelle Obama's most current book, and that's most interesting. I started to think it was not going to be so great after all, but she describes very much the development of her personality her husband's personality, what she sees developing in her daughter's personalities and their relationship to living out life based on her background, his background, and what the two of them together have tried to do to bring together you know, a family and raise children. Um, it's all in process. She's, she's very descriptive about it. And I'm finding it quite fascinating. Um, but the question comes to me as to how does someone like Toni Morrison develop such an awareness of the background that family brings to the present and into the future? And are her, in her own life, as you've learned about her, has she, was she able to project into the future her own family relationship systems? Because that's one of the things that in Bowen theory, the effort is to understand not only the past and how it relates to the present, but what we do in the present to, to move into the future generations. So um, I was just interested if you know Toni Morrison well enough to, to comment on that. Um, she brings it to her novels, but what is it in her that gives her that gift, that awareness? Uh, I think, yeah, her experience, um, she's talked a lot in interviews about her background. You see some similarities between, um, <clears throat> not so much this novel, but I would say, uh, she tells the story of her mother's mother, um, Ardelia, I forget the mother's mother's name, but the mother's mother looks at her as a little girl and calls her tainted, not because, because of her lighter skin. And it, it makes Toni Morrison feel, Chloe, before she became Toni Morrison, Chloe Wofford, subconscious, like there was something wrong with her because of her lighter skin. So she talks about that actual experience. Um, and then um, I think it's just her reading a lot of novels and, um, and, and, and building characters that are very relatable. Um, I, I know about her father's side is from Georgia 
And I know her mother's side is from Alabama. Her mother is a homemaker, was a deaconess in the AME church. There's a lot of AME in different parts of her novels. And then her dad um, um, was a steel, he worked with steel um, and he went to a steel town in Lorain, Ohio from, um, from Alabama. And so I think um, she talks about growing up in a very busy household. She had an older sister named Lois and I believe she was the youngest. Um, and she would always be with that older sister, Lois and Chloe, Lois and Chloe, Chloe and Lois. Um, that's what I know about, I don't know much about her childhood, uh, but I know the rough details of her parents. And um, I can't see say like any character in this novel, it, you could draw a direct line to her life that I have seen. I will say that what I wrote in my intro is that the story Morrison creates is based on an actual young girl in the UK who uh, was reprimanded by her teacher and told a lie that the teacher abused her sexually, molested her. And she, that's what it's based on. And so what I say in the intro is that Morrison switches the motive the real life motive of the girl in the UK was to uh, get back at her teacher for reprimanding her. Whereas in the novel, it's a very realistic reason why the daughter um, lies on her teacher because, you know, she wants the affection of her mother. So, yeah, but that, yeah. So she does take from real life, even if it's not hers to tell the story. It's just curiosity to me to see what brings an awareness of a process that's family relationship systems with such huge emotional overtones, because it's very hard to see through emotional overtones, as has been mentioned. And so uh, it, it's just something that intrigues me. Thank you very much. Okay. And Nicholson, it looks like you'll have the last question of the evening, and then we'll have any concluding uh, announcements and comments. And then, uh, Anne. Thank you. Well, I want to thank both of you for this really important evening. Um, some of the ideas I've thought of is, it seems to me that it's the nature of the attachment and what gets projected onto the child that um, sort of sets the stage for future problems. And so there are many mothers who might reject their child for, or for a number of reasons, not just the color of their skin. And um, Maybe all of us or many of us don't fully appreciate the intensity of the attachment to our offspring and how that plays out. And the other thing I wanted to say is that as the mother of a biracial son, um, and both my husband and I and our families are white, it took me a long time to fully appreciate that when he walked out the door, his life experience was different than mine. And I don't think there's any question about it that people perceive him differently um, than they do me. And therefore, he has to deal with challenges that I, as a white woman, or his father as a white man, do not. And so the question is, how does the nature of the attachment influence that? Because he is going to, he is in a world where there is racial bias. 
and learning how to navigate that for himself is most important. But he has two parents who didn't have that experience. And we're learning over the years how important that is to learn how to negotiate that for himself. And there's been a great value in having a child of color because it certainly has opened my eyes and I think my husband's eyes in a way that probably we wouldn't have experienced had we not had a child of color. So I wanna thank you for this evening. I can't wait to read these books and um, appreciate it. Okay. To your question of how um, with that attachment, how to raise a child, I mean, I would suggest um, just remembering that the world treats you how you see yourself, how you see yourself, regardless of whatever social constructions there are about Asian people or Black people, the, the, the truth holds the same, that um, the world will treat you how you treat yourself. So that's why it's important for children to be raised with confidence, um, children to be raised, children should be raised with confidence. And it seems like that is the case in your case. I just know that um, they are not responsible for others' faulty, incomplete perception. And then mm -hmm. remember to always practice the golden rule. If you wouldn't want anybody saying or doing something to you, don't even think about doing it to somebody else. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ann. And uh, thank you, Rowan. I appreciate being able to uh, invite you to come on this series and engage people. Most of our audience is very much engaged in, in Bowen theory. And so uh, to bring your literary perceptions uh, to this with all of the uh, nuanced insight into uh, family as revealed in uh, God Help the Child. So thank you. Thank uh, you. Kathleen Smith, do uh, we have any uh, final announcements? And uh, I know we yes. have- Yes, <laughs> first of all, and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Frazier for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you, Reverend Henley as well. Just a couple of announcements. We do have our clinical conference tomorrow with Priscilla Friesen uh, with the topic is um, growing older with Bowen theory. So if you're, you have a free day tomorrow or some free time, I'd encourage you uh, to go on to our Eventbrite page and register uh, for that. And then our next professional lecture will be actually pretty soon. It will be on February 9th with faculty member um, Kathleen Colley. And she will be presenting right before our, our faith leadership conference. Uh, her topic is life at the helm. What does the leader see and not see? So that should be an interesting uh, lecture as well. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Yeah, and then we uh, have and our faith leadership conference that day, the, the 10th. So for uh, all those day. involved in faith communities, we I invite you to sign up for that. So right. thank you all so much and have a good yeah. night. Okay. Thank you.